My name is Monk Rowe, and we are at the uh, morning after <laughs> with Dan and Chris Brubeck. Uh, played a marvelous concert in Welland Hall at Hamilton College last night. And yeah. I was enthralled by the interpretations of your father's music. Mm -hmm. um, the, the core of them were there, but how do you decide to bring them alive so that they fit the way you play? I think, uh, you know, certain things, uh, I'll hear other ways to play something like, uh, for instance, in Kathy's Waltz. I always heard that that could be a great kind of reggae feeling thing, which you wouldn't think of right away, but we tried it. And it was like, hey, that actually works great. And I remember at a, the recording session, Mike had worked out this whole opening thing. And he was like, ah, oh, well, yeah, that works great, but I'd, I'd really like to play, you know, a, a, a chordal guitar thing. And I was like, we'll do that in the beginning, and then we'll go into it, right? which is how we wound up doing it. But a lot of times, everyone's got their individual, like, ideas, and we just throw them out. And, um, you know, with my dad's music, I, I kind of know it inside out. So for years, all that stuff rattles around, and you hear it in different ways. Yeah. and. I, so many of his tunes, I'll, I'll be practicing and I'll think, oh, you could do this with that, and I'll just approach it completely differently. Uh, slightly for my own sanity, but you know, also just because you can interpret things so many different ways, and it's, it's good because later you can use that, even if you're not playing that particular style, you can use that in terms of what you add to a piece you know, how you approach it one night, say. And the other thing, just in general, is that the pianist in our group, Chuck Lamb, and a guitarist, Mike D'Amico, and Dan and I, it's a highly democratic process. You know, so when we put out a record or when we do a concert, it is sort of like a Venn diagram of all the things that we happen to think is cool. Probably much to our commercial demise, you know, well, you know, in terms of, like, for example, none of us wants to make a record that sounds anything like any Kenny G record, sorry, Kenny, or, you know, any of the hundreds of sax players that all sound the same to me that are sort of smooth jazz, you know, people, whatever. There is this thing that Chuck thinks is cool, Mike thinks is cool, we think is cool, and, and that's narrowly where we go. Um, but, you know, like when Dan was mentioning reggae, uh, like for Kathy's Waltz, it's just interesting to think of when Kathy's Waltz was written, Reggae didn't even exist, you know? So because our dad, you know, went out to the Middle East and he incorporated, you know, music that didn't exist in the United States, like the Turkish beat that became Blue Rondo, it, um, I feel like he sort of gave us the grand rights to, to explore and put other music into uh, our reinterpretations of his music. If he were our age, he'd, he'd be doing it. And, and the other thing is because of our age, we all have a rock and roll kind of influence, even though we're not playing rock and roll. But the, like I try to explain to people, like I said, well, Dan is a really interesting drummer. I mean, he's quite amazing, but think if Keith Moon played jazz, you know, because there's a different energy approach. And then Mike can do all the rock and roll stuff and Chuck is very percussive. So we all respect and like, you know, straight ahead bebop and all that kind of stuff. But we, we can't change what's crept into us culturally because of, of the age we are. And I know, conversely, you know, doing gigs with Dave and Jerry Mulligan and different people, they can't authentically incorporate any of that rock and roll language into what they're doing. Yeah, I've, I've heard that, like, you're still playing straight eighth notes, like with the older fellas, like in a big band, and they, um, you, you give them a rock number and they're still swinging. But yeah, they all sound like Herman Munster or something. <laughs> <you know. laughs> Dancing in the, the <laughs> twist. All right. Not all. I mean, there's some exceptions. But yeah. Yeah. mainly I'm just acknowledging that, that each generation has their cultural influences that are in their blood. So guitar, bass, drums, and keyboard mm -hmm. can be a rhythm section for a big band, but also a band in itself. So yeah. within a quartet, band, if we call you two the rhythm section within that, mm -hmm. who's the boss in, in your rhythm section? 
Uh, or is that I, I think it's totally to democratic. I don't think we yeah. look at each other as the boss. I mean, I do say that I look at myself as the bass player, as as having the mo more responsibilities uh, and and less freedom. Not that I would play any other way, because culturally and aesthetically, I grew up listening to Eugene Wright, who had a real defined role in the Dave Brubeck Quartet. Uh, and you know, there were other bass players in Gene's era. Uh, well, first of all, he came out of, you know, from playing with Count Basie and stuff like that. So he was a real meat and potatoes bass player, where part of the thing is like, like how thick are your fingers and how loud can you play <laughs> and play well, which has nothing to do with, you know, on the extreme end of, you know, Scott LaFaro is developing all this technique uh -huh. and all these other kind of bass players. And uh, in, in my case with an electric bass, like the whole Jaco Pastorius thing, you know, who was an incredible player and, and very, very technical and all the others that followed him. That was not my aesthetic. I mean, I was already set in my ways before Jocko Pastorius appeared on the map. My ways were I'm playing in a group, oftentimes with my dad. He's old school enough that he plays a lot of roots with his left hand. And when you're the bass player in that group, you either have to be with him or you're wrong. Whereas if you were playing with Herbie Hancock, the left hand is open. So the bass players have a lot more freedom to do different things because they won't be clashing with the left hand of the piano player because he's not playing roots anyhow. So you, you adjust to that kind of thing. And the responsibilities of Gene are keep track of the chord progressions, keep it simple. I mean, Joe, that, the chemistry of that group was incredible. Joe Morello couldn't have done all the beautiful things of flying away from core 4-4 four four without Gene taking the well, sort of the role and the sacrifice of I'm just going to, Dave always called it holding the fort. I'm holding the fort. Dave, you're doing your crazy polytonal, polyrhythmic stuff. Paul is flying over like a beautiful bird. Joe is dancing in and around with all these different kinds of rhythms. And that's his role. You two were, I think, 13 and 15 when that quartet ended. Does that mm. sound right about right, 1967? Yeah. Yep. And I wondered, did you, were you privy to any of the discussions? I mean, it, like, hardly any bands ever break up without some drama. So here you have a, a group that's basically world famous. What were your observations at that time? Did it make an impression on you, you know, as the family, like this thing that you sort of grew up with, with Eugene, right? And all these yeah. This is ending. <clears throat> well, I think, you know, I could see that there was a lot of stress in my dad trying to keep this band together, you know, like literally like getting everyone to show up and getting everyone to, because after all those years of being on the road, there, were, there was animosity between people. And uh, actually Paul and Dave were always pretty okay. And actually my dad, I think with everyone in the group was, was pretty okay but within the group there were different sort of stresses and actually I'd say Gene Wright too seemed to be very neutral about everything and could hold it together but there was always a lot of tension between Paul and Joe Morello for instance R right from the get-go I remember reading that in a, one of the recent books like he, yeah. he said if he stays I'm gone right the first recording session Paul didn't even show up that was his threat I'm boycotting and it was funny because Paul is the guy that brought Joe to Dave's attention because he heard him playing with Marion McPartland. Yeah. And Joe was like, had his handcuffs on, was playing brushes all night, and he's such a great player. And uh, that's what Paul wanted was another Joe Dodge, another guy who would be no threat to the chemistry of the counterpoint and the beautiful thing that Dave and him had going. Whereas Dave said to himself, if we really want to hit like a new plateau, I said, it wouldn't hurt us to have a killer drummer. Yeah. And so when Dave talked to Joe about joining the group, Joe kind of said, well, I don't know if I really want to <laughs> join your group because I, I heard you guys play and you don't let your drummer do anything. And then Dave was sort of like, well, we don't let him do anything kind of because he can't do anything. Right, you know? he swings his butt off, but he can't. He can't do know, anything he's, else. He's not like a soloist like a Buddy Rich or something. Right, and so he said, well, I got, you know, Marion's gig. I don't know if it's worth leaving. And, 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 my dad said, I promise that I'm going to give you a drum solo feature every night if you leave Marion and, and join our group. And he was probably thinking of leaving Marion anyhow because he was too handcuffed. 
you know, I don't want to imply Dave and Marion were good friends. I was going to ask. I wouldn't think like it was like stealing, you know, that kind of thing. So um, anyhow, in the first gig that they did, Joe did get the promise solo, and he played his ass off. Paul didn't know, like, oh my God, it's like, you know, the Frankenstein monster of the, the world's greatest <laughs> drummer is in my group, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> Fans went crazy, and suddenly Paul was being overshadowed. And very shortly was that recording session, and that's when he, you know, then Paul. Uh, said, he, he suddenly wasn't the limelight guy. Now there was a more democratic approach, and everyone was involved. And, and, and Dave, as a leader, you know, said, hey, Paul, you know, it's like, um, I think you're wrong about this. I think it's the perfect thing for our group to just really expand and break all the barriers. Uh, Joe can handle all the polyrhythmic stuff I can throw at him. And, he and can, odd, odd time signatures. No problem. You know, yeah. he's he's the cat, man. You know, and uh, so obviously that you know that's I'm proud of Dave's leadership. But you know, he was never a guy that like like, to my knowledge, ever literally fired anyone. Uh, and he wasn't that kind, you know, the, as far away as you can get from all the Buddy Rich stories you've ever heard, you know. Um, but by osmosis, the people that weren't right for his group would find their own creative ways to take themselves out of the group. Just, you know, it was like a cosmic decision on the players' behalf. I'm going to leave this band. I don't think it's right for me. They're, okay. <laughs> Just never, he said, you should leave. It's not right for you. You know, it was never one of those things. Yeah. yeah. Did that, that, uh, sort of leadership skill of avoiding conflicts. Was he like that as a father? I, I guess my question was prompted from uh, last night when you were talking to the audience, you said people often ask us what was it like to be a Brubeck kid or the Brubeck family. And you said, well, it was the only family we did, so I can't really answer that. But I was wondering, first of all, you must have learned what the word gig meant mm -hmm. at an early age. Mm -hmm. And your friends probably didn't know what the word gig meant. Right. Did it occur to you, at what age did it occur to you that my father and my mother are engaged in, in a business that most people are not? Well, I can say for me, one of my specific early memories is that uh, as you probably know, you know, Dave really messed up his back, broke his back, broke his neck in this diving accident in the late 40s in Hawaii. And so his back was always, you know, just a time bomb waiting to screw up. And, and so he would say, like, I have a concert and it would be not too far away. Does, and he would just say, does anyone want to come with me? And I, I remember I would... I liked it, and I said, yeah, I'll come with you. And he said, yeah, but and the, on the way back from the gig, you've got to sit in the back seat, and you've got to rub my shoulders to help me be able to drive back. So that was like part of the deal. I said, okay. And then I remember going to the concert and then seeing Dave and Joe and Gene and Paul playing and to well, like 1,000 people or 1,500 people, whatever it was, and see them going nuts and hear that great music. And you know, from a very early age, I, I thought, well, this is an attractive wonderful way to, to lead your life, you know? Uh, it, it's interesting, and, and of course, we know other families where there's great musicians, and they had the complete opposite thing. The parents, you know, weren't a model because they weren't in the arts. You know, what are you crazy? You should be a doctor or a lawyer, you know? Those people would fight against their heritage in order to become musicians. And in our case, uh, my parents wouldn't have been disappointed if we weren't musicians. And the, and the other th thing people imagine, like, you know, maybe it was there, Dave was there when I was with whips like Simon Legree, you must practice, you know. They weren't like that either. They encouraged us, but they weren't disciplinary about it. Yeah, and I, you know, for me, I, I remember, you know, specific times, like I went on the road with my dad when he went to Mexico, that, you know, was kind of a famous tour. And actually, Monk was on that tour, and... I guess it was a George Ween, you know, festival that went all over the place. And, and just, you know, being in these huge auditoriums and seeing people really going nuts, like literally picking up a row of chairs and <laughs> smashing them down. And you're going, whoa. That, I mean, people were really going crazy, like it was a, you know, a soccer game or something. Now, I, that was the first time I went, oh, like these guys are really like big stars, you know. It, 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 I had, 
It had never occurred to me, of course, it was a different kind of mentality in a different country. But the other thing that I, you know, made me recognize the business aspect of it would be, you know, coming home from school or something and seeing my mom, you know, sitting at a desk and going through fan mail and, you know, uh, just she constantly worked at stuff and they, they answered every bit of mail and sent out, you know, records to people and they were, they were very constant, consistent with their, um, you know, keeping a grassroots thing. Because my mom started out, she, she was actually uh, in a radio station and long ago she kind of figured out the whole Grateful Dead model. You know, go to all the radio stations and let them record the group playing and have them just, you know, give them the rights to just put it out there. It'll get, take, you know, more people will hear the band. And she, she was really business oriented and, and kind of opened up tons of doors. But just seeing her at work like that, that's when I realized the other side of it. I, I recognized the creative part of it and that's the attraction. And then you go, okay, but there is like, you know, uh, there's a lot of work involved in this too. It's not, it just doesn't happen if you're a creative person. You have to be able to go out there and really work for it. Yeah, and over the years, as he, as Dave wrote more and had more LPs out, keeping track of royalties and are we getting a fair s square deal here and all that. Right. That's and of course they weren't because they were the artists. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a given. <laughs> right. Well, I, I want to back up and, and yeah. say one thing uh, to your earlier question about Dave and the breakup of the group. Like, um, for me, I wasn't super on top of it because at that point I was going to Interlock and Arts Academy. So I knew it was going to happen and it was predicted. But to give you some insights on that, I mean, I think really what drove that decision was Dave relentlessly being on tour for, you know, 20 years or something. And the, the next thing that he really wanted to do was devote himself to writing big orchestral pieces and choral pieces. And, you know, he gave everyone in the group like a warning of at least a year, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years. Mm -hmm. And they sort of says, you're not really going to disband our group, you know, the most successful group, you know. And if you're Paul Desmond, you know, Paul had it easy. He, uh, he was a fantastic player and he could just show up and play beautifully. And Dave and Iola were doing all the work. Then in between, he could go to Bradley's or Lane's and, you know, do his happy, you know, drinking and hanging out. And they with could all this drag stuff. him onto the next plane or to the next gig. Yeah. 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 And, and I don't mean he was a raging alcoholic, but I, he just had a lifestyle. He, that he adored. Right, he did. Yeah, he would like, have traded it for anything. Right, and yeah. he was like, oh my God, if you break up the group, what, what am I going to do with my, go to my lifestyle? <laughs> you know, so, and, and Joe and, and you know, Gene, uh, and Dan's right. Like, my parents always had great admiration for Gene in terms of his personality. Like, he was just a guy. You know, Gene was very special, not only from his musical point of view, but people have to realize that... Um, Gene had to deal with being in the quartet and being wildly successful in a, in a little bit parallel to like Jackie Robinson. Yeah. Other black musicians were giving him crap about, you're playing hey, with these white guys, why are you band? playing yeah. with these white guys? You know, the white guys are stealing our music and all that kind of crap. And Gene just handled it with uh, typical diplomacy and grace, maybe. I don't know if that's how he got the name Senator. Or <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> but, and, and then also he had to deal with prejudice everywhere. You know, like they did the these opposite. tours of the South where they were saying, you can't go on stage with that guy and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It, they canceled huge amounts of, of uh, concerts in the South. I forget how many there were, like 23 concerts or something, where when they found out that, because the quartet before they got Jane, it was an all white group. So, I think Norman Bates was the bass player. You know, and our jazz goes to college and all that. So the image is, oh, great. You know, it's a white jazz group. That, that'll fly. <laughs> you know, so once there was the, the addition of, uh, of Gene, then, you know, they weren't so sure they wanted that on stage, you know. Yeah. I just read a thing um, 
about Cecil Taylor, and uh, I think it was about the five spot, and he had related how his quartet got a very small amount of money for playing a week, and then the Dave Brubeck Quartet came in, and they got three times what he did. And I wonder if Dave was aware of those things, because I know he would have hated it. Yeah. Well, he might have been. I mean, in terms of that sort of stuff, though, he had Joe Glazier, who was, you know, Louis Armstrong's manager, and um, he, uh, Joe was a very firm business guy. He knew those guys were in demand, and he pretty much would take everything to the limit of what uh, he could get from, you know, from a club owner or whatever, and he kind of knew what those limits yeah. were. Whereas I think a lot of times, I, mean, I know for myself over the years, I've called places, usually never get a call back, you know that whole story. And then it's like, well, you wanna come play, a uh, 100 bucks a man, you know, that kind of thing. And, and I think most people just go, oh man, I'm so, I so wanna play. But they were in a different position. You know, he had been on Time Magazine and, you know. So, so at that point, you, you take advantage of, you know, whatever you can get. And I guess you look at all the other people that got screwed, you're making, you're making up for it by getting something out of it. Yeah. And also to, to get into your uh, question more precisely, I mean, it, it would depend on, you know, what year was Cecil Taylor talking about and how popular was Dave compared to yeah, Cecil right. at that moment. I Certainly. mean, it, it could be a completely colorblind issue. You know, Dave had maybe already had Take Five as an international hit and probably Cecil Taylor just, and I'm just saying that because no one's had a big international hit that you could find on a jukebox. Like, it wouldn't matter if, if, if Cecil Taylor was God himself, that would be the business reality of like, if you're the club owner, how many- Yeah, how many people are gonna come and see this person? Oh, and speaking of jukeboxes, I wanna say another revelatory moment for me is I was on the road going to a concert uh, with, with dad in, in New Jersey and um, we went to a typical shiny silver Jersey diner. And um, then we sat down in the booth and it had one of those jukeboxes, you know, where you have the pages you flip. And I remember seeing there were Beatles songs and I thought, take five, debut by quartet. Holy God, my dad's made it. He's, he's in a jukebox <laughs> along with you know, the Beach Boys and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, you know. And, and, and that, by the way, that scene, it's just so beautifully manifested and portrayed in the movie Pleasantville when Jeff Daniels plays this, uh, you know, soda jerk. And it's a movie that's all, well, everyone's in black and white. They live in this TV land fantasy reality. And it's just, everyone is so cardboard. Hello, yeah, no, no, no. And, and they're, they're in a diner, right? Right, they're in a diner and they have a jukebox like that and they start playing Take Five and they're going like, and you can see their ears start to turn pink and it's like, it's like their brains are like, and they end up being in color. And they're going, what's, what's wrong with me? What's going on? You know, it's like, and it was, I, I, I wish I could talk to that director someday because um, uh, there it is. It's like Dave thought out of the box. It's a beat. It's not 4-4, four, four, it's 5-4. I think one of the reasons Take 5 was popular is the sort of drone kind of Middle, middle Eastern or the Indian thing of like a pedal and a modal thing. I think all these things sort of happen to come together. And uh, that's just, it just manifests so well. I mean, if we, if we had no time and how much time we could do our video show, I'd love to have that scene in our video salute because it says everything. Yeah, and I guess, you know, socially the implication is like, okay, we're, we're going from a drab world to the world's opening up and the colors are opening and Jackson Pollock's throwing paint and, you know, there a whole thing happened in that time period that, that really revolutionized the future, you know, and, and even the acceptance of the Beatles and all that. There was a lot of groundwork that was laid. Yeah, and Dave in his older years would say, when I look back at it, I guess in a, in a way, and I was kind of a pioneer of world music. You know, the stuff that came back from that tour mm -hmm. and made it into jazz. And of course, he was following the advice of Mio saying the same thing about, you know, when you travel, open your ears, incorporate music you hear in other countries into what you're doing, and then you'll be an innovator helping your art form grow. Cool. I've had the privilege of uh, being in a Brubeck house twice to interview your, your parents, and um, 
I was struck, Dave had been working on a piece the day I got there, and he took me to the piano. He said, come on. And it had, uh, it was for piano and voice, and the, the Afghanistan, the war in Afghanistan had just started, and it was reflective of that. And it was interesting because he said, Iola said, no one will want to sing it. It's too sad. Mm -hmm. And I got this little picture of their back and forth and, mm -hmm. and her opinions, voicing her opinions about his music, mm -hmm. and in addition to handling so much of the business. And it was just a neat moment. Yeah, well, she was deeply involved in the evolution uh, of all the religious pieces he wrote, and there's, you know, like 17 or 18 of them, where a lot of it would be Bible quotes. But, you know, one of the pieces like Gates of Justice is a combination of Old Testament, New Testament, and Martin Luther King. And, and Dan and I both know that, you know, like, there's so many misconceptions about my dad, but, you know, one of them is he wrote all this music that had biblical texts, and you might conclude, oh, he's Jimmy Swaggart that plays jazz piano or something. But as far as he's concerned, the biblical text is just a way to nail everyone for their fake Christian attitudes and the hypocrisy. You know, I'm going to point out to you in the Bible where Jesus is pointing out exactly what you're doing that's racist. Or after Kent State, you know, I was in the, I was the age, I was in high school, we did a piece he wrote called Truth Has Fallen. It was like from Isaiah, Truth Has Fallen in the Streets and Equity Cannot Enter. Like the National Guard shot college kids who were just, you know, having a good time and trying to put, you know, flowers in their guns. And what the hell is happening in America? But the most powerful way to say that instead of him saying it is quote the Bible and ram it right up there, you know. You pretend you're Christians, you know, how would Jesus have handled this situation, you know? He came to Catholicism fairly late in life, didn't he? Mm -hmm. I think I read something where he, someone asked him about it, and he said, well, I didn't come from anything. He, I don't know if he was an agnostic or No, just... he was an agnostic. No, actually, his mother was a Christian scientist. Which and... is a befuddling religion, if there ever was one. Yeah. And uh, I, his dad was a cowboy, <laughs> and so he had he had ethics and morality that were very much right down the lines of, of like he would never have done anything that wasn't sort of biblically correct in a certain way. But it wasn't through a religious following; it was through life experience. You know, you don't treat someone like that because it'll come back to get you, or you don't. You know, he, he had, wouldn't you say that, you know, he just had this kind of... Yeah, uh, the Judeo-Christian ethical morality thing was strong in his blood, you know. Okay. And Grandma Bessie was a Christian scientist. It was, it was just a very wacky religion. And Grandpa Pete believed in baked beans, stars, and rattlesnakes, you know. But yeah. uh, you combine those two and, uh, and, and, you know, World War II was a a deep experience for my dad. And um, that's when he vowed to himself, I want to get the tools so I can write a huge orchestral choral piece with biblical text that somehow does this thing about somehow changing hearts and minds so we don't have, another, I'm talking to you on the eve of maybe another European war right now with the, the Ukraine and Russia and NATO allies. But, you know, he's, he's going with Patton's army, seeing cities blown up. And, you know, even though he wasn't on, on uh, D-Day Beach, you know, like Saving Private Ryan in the horror show of that that was portrayed so beautifully or horribly in that movie, um, you know, he still saw plenty of horrible things and met lots of people and met lots of just regular Germans who thought, what happened to our country? You know, how the hell did this guy Adolf Hitler completely take us and throw us into this horrible thing and we ended up killing millions of people and they all believe you know that the christ is their savior you're like how is that happening and they're bombing the english you know it's just a it's such a a, a crazy thing i know I, I want to tell you a story that um you know who gene lees is yes gene, gene was doing an interview with with dave and he was asking him how did you get through world war war ii and what really affected you and our dad was saying that he had a book he carried in his knapsack and it was sort of like a history of 
of Europe or something. It's like a, a very thick book, which would be a funny thing for, for a trooper to have in his backpack along with an extra pair of boots and some socks, you know? <laughs> and he said, because I kept reading this to find out, um, to get a sense of, you know, if I take myself out of my own lifetime, where are we in the great scope of ebb and slow of, of history and democracy and authoritarian rule and wars? And um, so they had this deep talk and, and uh, Gene was out on the West Coast and they hung up the phone. And a few hours later, um, Gene had written down the title because he said, yeah, maybe I'll go out and try to find that book. I think it could be an insight into you. And he calls Dave up and he said, Dave, I want to, I want to tell you this. This is amazing. I found the book. And uh, my dad said, oh, I mean, I wish I could remember the exact title, you know, the history of Western civilization by so-and-so. And I said, well, that's amazing. He, he said, you don't understand. I found the book. He went to a used bookstore and it had David Warren Brubeck, PFC, written <laughs> in the book. Somehow it had ended up in a used bookstore. Now, how's that for a mystical? <laughs> so anyhow, back to, you know, that's why he was breaking up the quartet. I think he had good, after being sued and wiped out earlier in his career, he had enough money to put us through school. He had enough money that he didn't really, from record royalties and stuff, that he could really liberate himself from being on the road, which is. And he, and he wanted to spend more time, you know, with his kids and all that. Too. I wondered I mean, if, that he, if he was conflicted it. about missing baseball games and missing yeah, birthdays. Yeah, yeah, all that kind of stuff, yeah. yeah. And, and, and actually, our uh, second oldest brother had a lot of issues that, you know, he wasn't around to deal with. And I think that. He, he had a lot of sort of guilt around that. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that was a big part of it too, wanting to, uh, you know, be and help him. You know? But you know, it's also interesting to note, if I have my history right, that after he broke up the group and their last concert was in Pittsburgh, and I, mean, I remember being impressed seeing John Chancellor from the NBC Nightly News. That was the button on the national newscast. The Dave Brubeck Quartet gave their last concert tonight. You know, it's still, of that much importance. And then I think that coming summer, George Ween said, you know, Dave, you've never really played with Jerry, you know? Jerry Mulligan, he lives in Greenwich, just down the road. You guys would probably be a, a potent force, you know, if you, and so, you know, after not being on the road for six months, maybe Dave missed it a little more than he thought he would. Yeah, or maybe he thought, you know, with the quartet, it was just a constant grind, but that he could pick and choose you know, do yeah. some concerts. But Everyone's an independent contractor and no one's on salary and, mm -hmm. you know, there's a different sense of obligation. George Wayne puts it together and pays Jerry and pays him. Mm. And, you know, someone else do that. And then, right, right. And, you know, and Alan Dawson was a brilliant drummer and Jack Six and, and those guys made some wonderful records together. Yeah. Uh, so he sort of had his cake and ate it too. He was liberated from, you know, doing 150 concerts a year. But he could still play jazz with Jerry and Ellen and Jack. And me as a drummer, I was very lucky because I, uh, Joe was very inspiring. You know, it's like, oh man, I'd love to be able to play like that. But when Alan came along, there was someone that could really explain what he was doing. <laughs> he was just unbelievably, uh, you know, brilliant at saying, well, you know, tearing things apart and going, well, if you want to do that, you have to, you know, and just, uh, I learned so much from him. I was just, it was crazy, you know? Just very quickly, like within a short span of time, uh, he just taught me what I hadn't learned all my life, it felt like. Fortunate. Yeah. I wanted to ask you something about, I saw an unlikely thing in your house. Mm. A Baldwin exterminator amplifier. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the excretionator. <laughs> <laughs> I, because I played in a band once where the whole band was playing the, Baldwin. Played through the amp, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. To see it in the Brubeck home, just like, there's wonder, a story I behind those this. Are I don't worth. <laughs> say again? So I wonder what those things are worth. If they're worth anything? <laughs> they or are. I looked it up this morning. <laughs> you did? Are they Pe worth a fortune? No, they're not worth a fortune, but they're worth something. Yeah. Well, I know I, I played a gig with uh, the Los Angeles Jazz Orchestra, and we played it in a hall that was named after Karen Carpenter or, her, or Richard Carpenter or something. And uh, when I went out to the lobby to sign autographs and stuff, 
they had in a glass case this this thing about the carpenters, and there was one of those small Baldwin amps, like the oh, kind wow. we had. I mean, the reason we had Baldwin is Dave was a Baldwin piano artist, and he said, "Hey, your kids play rock and roll and stuff. You know, do you think they would like some amps?" And actually, you know, we had them for a while. And and actually, you know who's got the exterminator? Is my son-in-law, oh. who is a carpenter and a drummer. And he's got the exterminator set up so he can play back CDs so he can you know, bang along with it with Primus or some of these other guys. I knew there had to be a reason that this thing was, was in the <laughs> oh, sunken yeah, sun sun living room. That's really, oh, you know what? And I, I never quite, uh, you brought up the question of how did Dave become a Catholic? And it's a very interesting story. So he's always been interested in Jesus, all these different religions. There's times in our lives where Dan, uh, mainly he was, the, the prime mover, like a couple times we took Dave to meet, you know, like an Eastern religious leader like Baba Muktananda or Baba Haridas or these these different people. So he had an, an open mind. And, you know, one of the things I believe it was Haridas said, and you can correct me, Dan, if I'm wrong, what, you know, there's many paths to seek enlightenment, but his analogy, which always made a hell of a lot of sense to me, is you can keep exploring this and exploring that and exploring this, but if you ever want to get up to the mountaintop of whatever mountain, uh, whatever path you choose religiously, you've got to stick with one or you'll just keep jumping and jumping and never get anywhere. So um, when Dave wrote his beautiful mass called To Hope, he left out for some weird reason, because it's, it's a very structured thing, what, what goes into a concert mass from hundreds of years of tradition in Catholic music, church music. He left out the Our Father and one morning, he, it's a beautiful, beautiful, if you hear it, it's gorgeous, and it just sounds like it couldn't be written any other way. Like each thing, each note deserves to follow the next. You know, it's just one of those fell out of the sky perfect. And he dreamed that. And it was one of those dreams where he went like, oh man, it was, oh, I'm dreaming. I want to write that down before I forget. So he wrote it down. And it's beautiful, went to the mass, and through Dave, the final straw for making him to commit to one religion to get to enlightenment was he thought, well, God showed me and gave me that peace. And that was it. That reminds me of a story both Dave and Iola told me about being in a van, like a VW type van driving up to summer camp in Vermont music camp. Yeah. And that's when um, God's Love Made Visible was written. Oh, yeah. Probably driving Matthew to Ken Haven. I think you're something. right. That's what he said. Yeah. And, and Dave said, I'm done with this. And she said, no, you're not. <laughs> and I'll have to show you. Like, I'm telling you a story about your father that you don't know, I guess. It's a great story. And then he went up, got up there, and they were put up in an A-frame and up in the top attic were all the Christmas decorations. So he went up there and finished it. And, <laughs> and, uh, Surrounded by It's that. just very touching. Da me. Dan and I have often played that piece with our dad. Uh, it's called La Fiesta de la Posada. And it usually would happen, you know, in December of these performances. And God, Christmas has gotten so just pukingly commercialized. I was trying to think of a worse word than disgustingly, and I came up with that one. But I don't know if it's a real word. But, you know, you would get the real sense of Christmas and love when you do this piece, La Fiesta de la Posada, because it has a chorus, which is usually like town folk that like singing, you know, and that's a whole different thing. It's really, you know, it's almost communistic. It's not professional singers usually. It's just people that love singing. It's an expression of their spirit. They've got, and it's, there's a children's choir in it and there's a, a Mary, and there's three wise men. I mean, we've done it in Durango, Colorado, where they had Mary, they had a live donkey bringing Mary in. <laughs> that you was know. a questionable call. <laughs> yeah, well, the donkey <laughs> relieved himself on the way up to the stage. But, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and you know, the three wise men, it's like, it's funny, because like, if you just put on your funny hat, they've got sombreros, it looks like the three amigos, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 uh, you know reflective of the real tradition of uh, La Fiesta de la Posadas is about you know it's amazing what survived in the Bible that you have you know Joseph and Mary they're not rich they're really poor 
there are refugees, that's all set up. You know, we should have an open heart and kindness. Who knows what's going to come out of a refugee? I mean, look at Obama in a way. He's, well, not that his parents were refugees, but, you know. He was born in a different country. <laughs> <laughs> right, oh, yes, right, we right. all know that. No, but I mean, you know, he did come from a, a classic mother, father, yeah. uh, you know, leave it to beaver background. Yeah. It's like just that that potential is all there. And, and I just uh, wrote a piece that Dan and Darius played on the premiere. Um, called Mary Magdalene and the Garden Dweller. And I was hired specifically to write a piece in the style of Dave with jazz and also chorus and orchestra. And, and one of the things that amazes me is if you look at like how nuns don't have the powers of priests and you know the church has always been so patriarchal, but it's amazing that, that despite all that and despite all these filthy old bishops and abbots and probably popes that wanted to whitewash it, that Mary Magdalene is this powerful person who had more courage than all the disciples. When they're all quivering in their boots, hiding in an attic, she's the one that sees Jesus as a garden dweller and says, listen, you chicken shits, get out there and spread the gospel. You know, it's like, it's amazing <laughs> that that part has survived. How did that happen with all this? The, you know, and maybe, maybe that part's divine, that despite all, there must have been a huge conspiracy to get, get rid of that stuff, that empowered women, you know. But it's there, still in the Bible. That's some heavy stuff. Sorry. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff, you know, where you have Dave and Iola for parents who yeah. end up thinking about. That's what I was trying to, I couldn't fashion a question. Um, because to outside observers, they both seem like uh, incredible role models. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, the, if their children, the children think of their parents as role models. Yeah, yeah, we, we do. I mean, all, all of us have deep respect for yeah. our parents and all of us have deep respect for the, the luck we have of being born into this family. Mm -hmm. Now, we, I, uh, my wife and I were blessed with two daughters who hardly ever gave us many problems, but we did have a timeout chair. And I mm -hmm. wonder if you had- Did it have the famous artwork on it? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that fancy. <laughs> did, did your, uh, was, uh, was there a disciplinary uh, uh, modus operandi with, with your parents if, if you like acted yeah, out? Well, when we were little kids, there was an infamous mythological belt called the Wapper Dapper that we never saw, but we heard about it. Yeah, if you get out of line, you know, I'm gonna have to take out the Wapper Dapper, which was, <laughs> as far as we could figure, was like a big ass cowboy belt. <laughs> Maybe had some of those little uh, silver dollar buffalo things <laughs> left in them so it would hurt extra hard. But, uh, you know, so the, and our, certainly our grandma Myrtle, <laughs> I still remember, in fact, this relates directly, when they were gone a long time in that tour in 58, uh, Grandma Myrtle, as the name might imply, was a tall, uh, just completely straight ahead kind of person. Like the famous, you know, painting that you see in the cornflake box. She, she, would make, she would make that lady look like a complete Roaring Twenties floozy. You know, she was just such a stiff, straight ahead person. And so I did something wrong. And she, being of a previous generation, said, you know, you're going to... I'm going to give you a spanking. And I can't even remember what I did wrong. But I remember like, I got an idea. And I'm always a clever one. I put a Dr. Seuss book in the back of my pants. So she, when she spanked me, you know, it wouldn't hurt as much. And of course, she never noticed. No. The book was removed and I got double the spanking. Because <laughs> she stayed with us for a couple of months. Well, mom and, and Darius and Michael were with Dave on that famous Middle Eastern tour. Was there sibling rivalry on and off? Be I actually, guess musically is my question, but maybe with other things. Actually, I, I, don't, I don't think so, so much. You know, we were mainly harmoniously playing together in different things, and sometimes we'd temporarily pull in the same direction and pull in different directions. But... Uh, now, I don't want to read anything into this, but you, you both have had your own groups and continue to and like most musicians you wear many hats to create the the music you do 
when you lead your own groups. Do you think you've made a conscious or unconscious decision to sort of separate it from the, the Brubeck uh, heritage? Well, I know when I, uh, in my group, I, uh, there is the bass player in the group is a singer. And actually the way it, it happened very organically because I was playing gigs around Vancouver and um, I, you know, was using different people and someone said, oh, you should try this bass player. So I, this guy, Adam Thomas, came, played on a gig. He was a great bass player and uh, upright bass. And a couple of gigs in, you know, when I called him for this and that, um, I called, I think I called in your own sweet way, and he, and he said, do you want me to sing it? And I was like, well, this could be horrible or it could be great, but there's, you know, whatever, 30 people out there, who cares? You know, just, sure, go ahead, sing it. And he just sounded great singing it. And um, I realized that no one had ever done... Um, taken my mom's lyrics and you know put put together uh, everything that or not it wouldn't be everything but put together like we, we did a double album where it was all you know lyrics that my mom had written and songs my dad had uh, written for my mom wrote the lyrics for the tunes my dad wrote and um, you know, no one had really done that before, so I thought, well, this is this is a good vehicle to try it. You know, but as far as uh, you know, in that group, we often prior to that project, we would just play all kinds of tunes and and just you know pick tunes that we liked playing and you know like you would on a normal jazz gig. Um, so I don't know. That's a weird way of explaining it, but that that was the one thing that gave us a, a direction. And then that kind of took off, and we actually got nominated for a Juno. And all we literally did was put record a, a concert that we did at the cellar in Vancouver, and uh, and put it out. Um, and mostly because I wanted those tunes recorded, and it got you know picked up by the Juno people, and they were like, "This is amazing!" And so we almost won a Juno. We were in the last three of, uh, you know, best jazz record. You know, you should go back for the and talk about the Dolphins. Cause there's well, yeah, I mean, I, I've I had different groups. Uh, Which I heard in Utica. Oh, you did? Uh, huh, in Utica, yeah. I'm trying to remember the club. Tinies. Tinies, there we go, yeah. Yeah, and that group, you know, Mike was in that group too, the guitar player that played last night. Um, and that was an interesting band because, you know, it was like a far cry away from anything I had really done. So I, I had to kind of discipline myself to, you know, really play parts. And there was a lot of complicated music in that. Yeah, uh, arrangements were crazy. It, yeah, just ridiculous arrangements and very tight. And uh, all the records we did were with DMP, and that was live to two track. So when you hear those records, I think the most amazing thing is to know that it's all live. You know, that there was no overdubbing, none of that stuff. And to, to have gotten that on, on record as complicated as that music was. I guess the only thing that was ever harder is we did uh, some Larry Coriel recordings and that was uh, direct to disc where they put the put a, a vinyl thing, they heat it up, they stick it on, they put a thing, and they... Like the old days. Yeah, like it goes days, like literally right into the vinyl. Yeah. And in fact, two studios in Nashville were involved. Mm -hmm. So there was two side-by-side -side studios. Yeah, there were so many studios, you know, it was like one was half a block from the other, and the thing is going on. Yeah, uh, but that's crazy, because you have to do a whole half of a record. Yeah, it's not a tune at a time. It's a whole side of a record at a time. And so if you made a mistake, it's like, ugh, I gotta go back and the, you know, and the guy's gotta heat up the vinyl and the, you know, <laughs> that process was incredible. There is a, there's a funny story that goes with that, which is, um, and they're actually really good records, but Darius had written a song called The Midnight Sailor. And um, 
that was the one that was the worst where it was never our fault. Uh, it was like, you know, one time a cop car went down the alley between the two and like on the take, it was like, we got to be four or five with and I was like, oh no. And it was like, it was 18 minutes into a beautiful performance of three <laughs> yeah. tunes on one side. So that got scrapped. And another time like, oh, we got a bump in the vinyl. We got to start again. And each time this would happen, Larry would, we'd take a break while they reset everything and he'd have another beer. So we got, we're finally to the fifth attempt at doing this whole sign. And um, at that point, when it comes to Larry's guitar solo, he was very inventive. <laughs> Out comes the beer bottle, and it's become the, the, like a slide guitar thing with the, with the Heineken beer bottle. And you can hear it to, to this day on that record. It actually sounds kind of great, you know? <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned Darius because there's, a, there's this wonderful picture in the recent book about your father, A, a Life in Time, and you three are standing behind your parents. And it struck me, it looks, it be, it's the time, of the era. It, it looks like Dave and Iola go to hate Asbury. <laughs> because you all had really long hair. Right. And, uh, and it just is so uh, terrific to see that combination of the you know, the generations, and I'm even not sure what I'm trying to say, except it's a, well, it, it's it a is great funny. pick. <laughs> like, um, you know, because at that point, Jerry Mulligan had really long hair and beard, and we were bell bottoms and stuff, and uh, I think Maynard Ferguson. There, I mean, there was a lot of establishment jazz guys, instead of fighting it, just started going with the flow uh, on that thing. Hey, and to your previous question, we were talking about dance groups. I just wanted to say that when I was coming out of Interlochen, I met all these young, very good classical musicians that also loved rock and roll. And we had uh, school bands and we said, hey, when we graduate, we're gonna make a demo tape, see if we can get a deal. And I very consciously knew that Dave was this really popular figure in jazz. And I couldn't compete in that world, but I really wanted to have a really, really creative rock and roll band. And the first, thing we did was a group was called New Heavenly Blue. We did a record on RCA and then we did a record on Atlantic and that evolved into a group called Sky King uh, that we did a record on Columbia. And uh, Mad Cat, the great harmonica player who I still play with and who played in two generations of Rubik, he was in that band. And you know, the Sky King thing was, uh, was really quite cool. But the legendary guitarist Steve Cropper produced us and we brought in the Tower of Power horns. Uh, at one point, we were cutting our second record, and the pr producer was uh, Randy Brecker, because they had just done the Brecker Brothers record with Skunk Funk, and I could convince Bruce Lundfall, that's one of the best produced records ever. If we have to have a producer, let's bring this guy in. And then Bob James got involved, and then Randy said, hey, I want to bring in my friend, you know, uh, he's a great background guy and we'll, we'll bring in these singers. So it was like uh, Whitney Houston's mother, Sissy Houston, and some other. Uh, and these, Mike Brecker played on that record Right, too, and, Mike, yeah. and, and Jerry yeah. Braganzi. And um, also, also the background singer coach was this guy named Luther, Luther Vandross. You know, it's like, and that record never even came out because, <laughs> because the guy that was head of Columbia a and Mickey Eichner, was a complete idiot. I hope he hears this someday. Uh, he's probably gone, but um, he was totally threatened to have Bob James on Tabasie Records come into the Columbia label fold. So just by bad luck, the first project he could kill to show Bob James who he had more power, it was our record. So despite it being ready to go and us touring the country and on radio stations saying, we're playing tracks from our new record, you know, that much far. It, it didn't happen, and so like half the guys in, in that group just quit the music business. We, they were so demoralized. There's a long story about lawyers selling us out and getting rewarded for it and all this kind of stuff. And um, my dad said, oh, Chris, don't be blue about that stuff. You know, why don't you just start playing bass with me? So I did. Not a bad uh, solution to that problem. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Well, I've been just enjoyed so much talking to you both, and it's it's hard to imagine that uh, Dave passed away just about ten years ago. It's really hard to imagine that it's yeah been ten years. It's crazy. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that the uh, library in, in Wilton is becoming or has become a home for 
the archives. The archives, yeah. Yeah, yeah and we were, we were really thrilled that, that uh, and surprised that at a time when he may have had a vote that could save democracy in America, he, uh, that was canceled for a couple days. And so he came up and Richard Blumenthal did the ribbon cutting, our, our state senator. And when we met him, I just, you know, you don't know what his background is. The first thing he says, he says, we grew up in a classical household, the Blumenthal household. And my brother and I, our big rebellions, we'd go out and buy your dad's records. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew like Obama and Clinton, you know, we had someone that actually got it, you know, yeah. that was glad to be there. And that was a wonderful thing. Well, the fact that you're doing this and you have the Brubeck News going on, which I just read this morning, uh, um, it, it's terrific. And I, I thank you for doing it. It's, it's really important. And even though it was delayed for a year and a half, I guess, it's all good. It, <laughs> yeah, it's coming back. It's it coming is all back. good. And I got to say that, you know, like the manifestation of that Brubeck News thing that you read, you know, wouldn't happen if it weren't for my wife working tirelessly on this. Um, you know, she was very close to Dave and Iola, and uh, she helped them with a lot of stuff. And that's sort of what she does a lot to keep us going, too. So I'm very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to send you out into a snowstorm, I guess, mm. from the sounds of things. But uh, I wish you safe travels and continue success. Yeah, and thank you. And, and I think that what you're doing up here is, is so important. Uh, you know, it's like I, my next birthday, I'm going to be 70. So I uh, have to be a little bit realistic, even though I feel like I'm still a 13 year old kid that loves music. With a Baldwin exterminator. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. The exterminator might come and visit me. The grim exterminator. The grim exterminator. Blue and white, you know, that looks like a refrigerator. And he's got his scythe, you know. And so uh, someday, hopefully, people will, will be looking at this laughing and like, wow, this is uh, semi-interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I'll see you on the flip side. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's fun. Well, thank you.